This is Continuum Drag, a weekly podcast where we watch sci-fi, fantasy, and everything in between. This week, Sequest DSV, Season 1, Episodes 7 and 8. I was hurled across my room by an apparition. Or you fell out of bed. Anyone on your staff studied paranormal experiences? Um, Levin did a stint researching hypnotic regression at Cologne. Good, thank you. Have him come to the bridge. Um, there are also a couple of crewmen in engineering who worship their war. <laughs> Welcome to Continuum Drag, the podcast broadcast to French kids as they suffocate at the bottom of the ocean. I'm Luke, here with my co-host Jordan. What's real, Jordan? You know, I, I wrote down something uh, that I came across this week, and it reminded me of um, my feelings of Sequest. And I think they're probably different than your feelings, because I, I think you are angry about it. But here's here's what it was. It's uh, Pitchfork Music's review of Coldplay's first album, and it was this. Pretty, lovely, fine, fair... Calmly, pleasant, agreeable, acceptable, adequate, satisfactory, nice, benign, harmless, innocuous, innocent, largely unobjectionable, safe, forgettable. <laughs> That's how I feel about this show. <laughs> wow. A decent, decent uh, review of the show, I suppose. Yeah. I would yeah. say accurate, yeah. I mean, to be fair, I will say I was quite sick last week when we recorded the episode, so maybe that had to do with my very uh, aggressive take on Sequest. <laughs> We'll see. We'll find out this week if it changed at all. Um, but before we do, that voice you heard is our guest this week, Derek. Welcome to the podcast, Derek. Hi guys. Thanks for having me. I like that you waved on the uh, on the audio <laughs> on the video feed. You never know. You guys might step it up and make a YouTube channel. <laughs> We're never gonna step it up. Okay. <laughs> Derek. Since you're here for the first time, and it's great to have you, it's very exciting for me personally. Me too. Uh, I wanted to ask, what is your kind of relationship with this sort of like sci-fi TV watch? We watch is it is it a thing you used to watch, or something you watch now, or is it something that you're like a a bit distant from the sort of sci-fi TV? Uh, genre? No, yes, yes, and yes. I'm definitely a lifelong nerd of watching questionable television shows. Uh, I definitely rem- I don't really remember the details of Sequest. But uh, I do recall watching it fairly religiously. I think same with a lot of shows you guys have uh, you guys have covered. Yeah, yeah. I guess this one really was in a sweet spot in my childhood and yours as well. I'm sure where it was just like oh yeah, watching yeah. lots of TV and Sequest was really heavily marketed to t- uh, like preteen boys. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Well. Does it live up to your memory so far? You don't have to get into the details of these episodes, but was it was it up to what you recalled? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that question. <laughs> I think it was like Jordan said in his review. Uh, <laughs> very, very dramatic. Yes, no. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I thought. It's familiar faces, and that's about all I got. You know, when I was watching uh, the two episodes this week, uh, Luke and I last week uh, had been talking about the show and had sort of uh, mentioned how similar it was to Star Trek Next Generation. Um, probably intentional. Um, with how some of the similarities and some of the characters and some of the, the style of the show. But as I was watching it, I think it's actually, in its greatest aspirations, what this show wants to be is not Star Trek The Next Generation. It's Baywatch. <laughs> I think that's what this show wants to be. And I think that's the level they're going to be hitting at. It's sort of like the level of crime that you'd see on Baywatch or the level of adventure you'd see on Baywatch or the level of characterizations and world building it's about that level and i don't know if that's maybe being too forgiving but when i sort of realized that i was like all right let's do this i get what this show is this is just this is just mitch buchanan under the water yeah all right all right all right (laughs) i could see that i hadn't thought about it and i didn't watch a lot of baywatch so maybe that's what's hindering me here (laughs) you didn't watch a lot of baywatch Uh, sadly i mean those were some nuanced plots let me tell you (laughs) Well, then why don't we get into these episodes? We'll start discussing the show. Here's the IMDb summary for Season 1, Episode 7, Night of Shadows. When Bridger is hurled across his quarters by unknown force, 
It leads the sea quest to find a hundred-year-old sunken ship where the spirits of those who perished there haunt its ancient hall, one of which possesses Dr. Westphalen. I wrote something at the beginning of my notes here, and this might make me a biased viewer, but I think I might hate ghost episodes of TV shows. And the only reason I mention it is I could think of two shows where they're the absolute worst episodes. And one is My So-Called Life that was around uh, on TV around this time. And there's a Halloween episode where she's visited from a ghost from the 1950s. And for a show that was like grounded in realism, it was a terrible, terrible episode. And the other one is that Star Trek episode where Beverly falls in love with a ghost. Remember that one? It was like later season. It was got to be like six or seven. And it's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible Star Trek episode. And then I was like, as soon as about two minutes in, that hand comes out of the water and touches Nathan on the shoulder. I was like, oh, this is going to be a rough ride. Well, I mean, I was a little more forgiving of this. <laughs> I like Were ghost you really? episodes. I like ghost episodes. <laughs> well, there you go. There's two two sides of the spectrum. I, I I thought if you'd asked me on paper, like, do you like ghost episodes? I said, absolutely, I do. And then I started watching this. I was like, I don't think I do at all. <laughs> Derek, opinion on ghost episodes? Uh, after this experience, I think I'm a, I'm a no. <laughs> it's going to be a no for me. Yeah, a no for yeah. me here. <laughs> Maybe it's a hold only ghosts. Every episode's ghosts. Maybe then that's a little bit better, but not a weird one-off. Just the weird one-off ghost episode. It is very funny. I mean, we're watching a best of run of this, so we've only watched the pilot before this. And then this <laughs> episode we come in, it's just like, it's our ghost episode. And it's, I was just like, okie dokie. It was a weird one to come in on. It, it is the um, Halloween episode. I looked up, I was like, this has got to be their Halloween episode. And it is, it, it is. aired on October 31st. So, okay, they'll they'll gain one point for that. That was a question <laughs> I had, actually, was if it was Halloween or not. So, yeah, that that's a good, that's a point. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I know when I saw the opening credits and they were formed by lightning strikes, I was just like, okay, well, this has to be a very special episode. And I also thought it was funny. I opened up the IMDb. I'm like, on Halloween night, eh? I can't imagine there are a lot of teens gathered around or preteens gathered around their TV. They're all trick-or-treating. They really missed the ghost episode. Maybe that's why I don't remember this one. (laughs) But yes, Jordan, as you said, there's an opening where we'll get ghosts right away. But there's something I kind of forgot until I was going back through my own notes. But there's like a preamble to the cold open where Nathan Bridger is kind of staring longingly at his holographic wife, as he (laughs) usually does. And he gives a little monologue about how what we're going to be hearing from him is a ghost story. And I was like, what? Or a love story. It's not a ghost story. It's a love story. And I was like, what is this weird? I'd forgotten they did it. And there's just such a weird preamble. Like, get ready for a love story. And I'm just like, "Mm, I don't want to. Thank you. (laughs) Was that in the first episode too? That little preamble? No, it seemed like it was added. Like maybe this, maybe the episode is running short or something. It was just such an odd little preamble. Because then the cold open starts and it is him just, like, in his quarters, wearing a nice bathrobe. <laughs> yeah, he's got a very nice quarters for being in a submarine. I know, a lot of space in there. It's pretty sick, yeah. Art on the walls. <laughs> <laughs> his cool holographic, uh, per- the professor, I think he's called, this holographic man who just comes out of the mist. <laughs> is that, like, the ship identity or whatever? Sort of. Um, they introduce it in the pilot and they're just like, and we've got this great AI that will help you with your moral and ethical decisions. Huh. So better AI than what we have now. Yeah, exactly. Like Nathan walks into his room and he's like, hey, uh, uh, computer system, should I peek on that lady when she's changing? And the computer's like, no, don't do it. He's like, ah, thanks for, thanks for your moral guidance. <laughs> Pretty helpful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But the uh, the hologram is spouting some coordinates in the sea somewhere, and he thinks it's broken initially, but he, he goes and grabs what I thought was very funny. He just has paper maps of the ocean in his bookshelf. He has, like, just hardcover-bound books of paper maps, so he's, like, looking up the coordinates in a map book. It's so weird. <laughs> and then out of the mist comes a ghostly hand that spooks him, and this is sort of our, our, our cue that... Uh, Ghosts are going to be in this episode because before long he's he's staring at a uh, drowning ghost woman in the holographic image, and then a ghost head flies out. That my note when I saw it was, is that Richard Nixon with a mustache flying at him? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's just some dude, just a dude with a mustache, and uh, he is hurtled across a room that I thought I felt like the elderly. Um, what's his name, Jordan? What's the actor's name? <laughs> Oh, Roy Scheider? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's hurled so hard across the room, I was like, this man has broken his hip. That was too hard for that old man to fly. (laughs) I was very concerned as well, yeah. 
Hopefully he had a stunt double. It was it was too much. <laughs> yeah. Question though, at, uh, we've only seen the pilot of the show, and I assume the episodes up to this, episodes two through six, are pretty grounded in the world they've built. Obviously, it's a sci-fi show, but it's set in the future, so there's some futuristic elements. I'm assuming this is the first time they've gone to a like fantasy level of introducing ghosts. It's a real choice. Like I know it might just be a one-off, but I'm assuming once you introduce ghosts, like the gloves are off, isn't it? Like anything can happen now in a show, for better or worse, wouldn't you think? Yeah. <laughs> that is the implication, I would imagine. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about jumping over sharks, for sure. <laughs> and, and it's only, what, seven episodes in? So, I mean, it's... I don't know if this was a thing they were just like, hey, let's just do it. It'll be fun. It's a Halloween episode. It sweeps or whatever it is. Or if it literally is them going, let's try this and maybe, sure, maybe there's ghosts. And the next time there'll be this. Because, again, the tone in the in the pilot, it seemed clear that wasn't what the world was. You know what I mean? We didn't see anybody with, I don't know, gills. Or there wasn't anything... That was um, too far out in the fantasy, other than um, a dolphin that could speak through a robotic thing. But that was at least in some feasible technology. Yeah, I definitely didn't remember this sort of direction for the show from from when I watched it. As a, it was not what so it felt pretty weird watching this one for sure. <laughs> they. Um... Start building in this idea. There's the uh, police, uh, military police chief, um, what's his name, Crocker. And he is very, like, superstitious. He's got all these, like, old sea kind of things he's going. And I kind of wish they'd leaned into that where it was just, like, just, like, all these old sea superstitions. Like, maybe that's what's happening here. Like, I, I kind of wished it was him who was solving the problem using, like, you know, salt on the ground and constantly spitting in thresholds. Only his old sea superstitions would solve the problem. It tends to just be color in the episode, but I'm just like, I was like, I'd be way more sold on this if it was just like, yeah, yeah, all these old sea shanties are true. Don't, there's there's mermaids down here. Get ready. Uh, you, you make an interesting point, though, Luke. You said you wish that character had been solving the mystery or, or the crime or the problem. I'm going to argue, and maybe you won't agree with me, I'm going to argue Sequest didn't need to be there at all. I mean, Sequest does technically uh, settle some un- unfinished business for some ghosts, but, uh, you know, anyone could have come by probably. Yeah, like I just think for having a boat that's so specific and has such specialized abilities and technologies, I don't know if they really helped. <laughs> well, let's let's get into it then, because after he's tossed across the room, Bridger goes to see uh, the head of science, Dr. Westphalen, who apparently also just does medicine for him. I was just like, she's in charge of the science division. Why is she, why is she giving him first aid? Well, because she's Dr. Crusher. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But the basic <laughs> idea is there. he's just like, listen, I saw a ghost. Ghosts are real. Let's not debate this any further. We're, we're all on board. Ghosts are happening. And um, he's like, do you have any scientists on this boat who specialize in paranormal sciences? And she's like, of course, Dr. Lavin. He's here, right here. We can just get our, our ghost specialist doctor. <laughs> Is he another regular? This is the first we're seeing him. Okay. I looked it up, and I think he's done four. Um, I think this character's done like a little. He's been in four episodes, but he does come out of nowhere for us as far as we're concerned. And I think we'll see him again next episode, and that'll be the final episode he's ever in. So it's just like weirdly this guy is just here for four episodes and is like the expert on whatever the problem that week is. Weirdest problems. It seemed weird to me because um, the... The ca- it's not that the cast is bloated. There is quite a few cast members, but as we've seen, and I've said this before in lots of these shows we've watched, sometimes these shows have large casts because I think they're trying to hit different demographics or have different sort of uh, viewers be able to, to you know, uh, empathize with certain people or, or see themselves in them. But this does have a large cast, and then they're like, you know who would be good to, uh, uh, to help us with this? Another character you haven't met before. I'm like, well... You've already got 14 characters sitting around the bridge. Give uh, old Sam Raimi's brother something to do. (laughs) But essentially, they get going pretty quickly. They they head to the ghostly coordinates per Bridger's uh, dream. And it's really weird because as they're heading there, Bridger's like talking and telling them, oh, I had a vision of like a cruise ship corridor. I'm just like, when when did that happen? Like, there's all this stuff that happened apparently between sequences we've seen. It's only been like three minutes of the show. But... When they get to the coordinates, their comms channel starts picking up classical music in the ocean. And, of course, what they've done is they've discovered the sunken ghost ship, the USS St. George. Uh, it went down in 1913. 
Um, everyone got off because apparently it sunk very slowly, with the exception of the captain and the engineer, which <laughs> sunk with it for some reason. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite details when they're just like, yeah, it sunk slowly over many days. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> I mean, I mean, if that if that's not a plot that you are on the edge of your seat for, because you're like, <laughs> it, these must be the ghosts. I want to know why. It, it's just so weird they've set this up and like, honestly, no viewer would be excited about this. This is not an exciting show. Well, where they get where they get you excited is when they're like, hey, our computer systems <laughs> happens to have some old home movies the ship's owner had of the ill-fated voyage. <laughs> and I love they cut to it. And it's like old like fake 1913 film cameras but from multiple angles and i'm just like <laughs> okay uh, he has two and then i actually do think at some point in one of the angles you see a different cameraman so like someone was shooting this was like we have to justify their the home movies having multiple angles uh the rich guy has multiple men co- following him around shooting his home vacation <laughs> but luke it's in the service of a very important thing because when they're looking at the footage they see two things one is they see a woman who they who uh uh Bridger Bridger is that his name Nathan Bridger Bridges yeah that's it Bridger doesn't matter Nathan <laughs> sees sees a uh, a woman that he pretty is pretty sure is the woman from the footage and then we're also gonna get that cool effect that you see in like horror movies where the footage is frozen and then one of the characters looks directly at them being like boo I'm a ghost yeah it's really good I liked that this owner's home movies were just like. Of the owner, and then suddenly the, I guess the people recording were like, hey, we should follow his nanny around for a second. She seems to be having a meet cute with the engineer of the ship. And they're like, oh, now, now zoom in on that captain over there. He seems to be jealous of the meet cute that's happening. It's a really good camera work. Yeah, I know. These guys in 1913. <laughs> Those cameras were huge, too. They were like the weight of one man. <laughs> But it's very funny. It's just like we get all we need to know about the relationships from the home movies. It's like, oh, so these two fell in love and this captain is a little jealous, I see. <laughs> and the uh, crews all gather around. They're all watching. and They're just like, well, that explains why this drowned woman wasn't on the manifest when we looked at it. Because she was the owner's nanny. And I guess the nanny didn't get put on the manifest. It doesn't count. Like, but what was the point of that? That was because they kept going back to like, they're not on the manifest. And you're like who cares? And they're like, we need to find out who this person is. It's like, I don't know, who cares? Like, does it, it would it matter if they were on the manifest or not? There's like, let's say there's 800 people in the manifest. It's, they still would have to figure out who the woman was. Well, this was everyone got off the ship except for the two guys. And then there's more people. Honestly, did you care? Well, it's a stretch. No, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> they, you know, they tried to cover their bases. It just, yeah. So, okay. No, uh, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> it is true. It is like they wanted to make sure we, they hit all the beats. They're like, people are going to wonder. We want a mystery here. Well, that's a, that's a good point, though. I think that is what they're setting up. And for whatever reason, and maybe it's just me, it just felt like everything they were doing is falling flat. And I think maybe because this was out of the show's comfort level. Again, this is Baywatch. That's what they want to be doing. And they're like, what if we do like Baywatch Nights? No, you can't do that. And so I think they're just out of their comfort zone. And you get this weird episode where they're just like you know what it is it's like oh it's it's two people who were loved but couldn't get together and they died on the ship that's what it is so sequest go down why, why are we spending 45 minutes doing this well i don't have an answer for you there but i do know we get some <laughs> high-end vfx here because they send their hyper reality probe out to uh check out this sunken ship which they discover somehow they've sealed the ship after it sunk and there's still lights on inside but the, like it's also baffling, but at least we get to see this like very bizarre. I don't know. Were they cutting between like actual footage of sunken ships and some CG work? It was such a weird sequence of like showing off this sunken ship. I think you're right. I think it might have been a mix of both. I think that's what it was. I thought it looked okay. I, we've talked about this before. I think the special effects, I think for the most part, work pretty well. It's when they get into a little bit too much movement, you kind of see how smooth everything is. But I think for the most part, it's not. It's not bad. I, I actually quite like the little. Uh, uh, the stupidity of her putting on a headset and her little gloves, power gloves, to move the move the thing around. I'm like, sure, why not? That that part I enjoy. What do you think of these effects, Derek? Oh man, that, I I was fully behind the power gloves. And VR, <laughs> it was so good. I know I'm too hard on these effects, Jordan. You're totally right to call me out on it. But literally, there was a sequence I think where uh, like the drone flies through like a 
some scaffolding or like a, a staircase or something. <laughs> there's literally a render error. I'm like, well, there's a render error. <laughs> yeah, it's well, like going through the top of the ship. <laughs> I will say, it, and not in this episode, the next episode, but uh, there's a point where the, uh, uh, what's the ship called? Sequest? It's sitting on like <laughs> like a crest of like a cliff under the water and they keep showing a shot of rubble falling off of uh, off the cliff that they're sitting on and they go back to the same shot, the same special effects three times. I'm like, guys, Come on now, and even then, I'm for, I'm trying to you know forgive some of the things. I was like, guys, you could at least pick a slightly different shot. Rendering used to take a long time, you know. It's true. <laughs> we all we need is one. We'll just go back. People won't know the difference. Yeah, yeah. Like old Spider Man's. <laughs> but yes, essentially, what it is is some for some reason the ship has been sealed. There appears to be air on it. You could, they could potentially enter this sunken ship and walk around suit free because there's oxygen on it. So they they're they're like we got to go down there. We got to check it out. We got to look into this ghost that Bridger saw, and um, just to be safe, they're gonna bring the kid genius Lucas with them onto this hundred year old ship that's sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Because as everyone knows, quote legend has it, the kids are immune to supernatural. <laughs> I was like, everybody knows this. We all know this at home. Kids can't be affected by the supernatural. You know what? That got another point for me because I was just like, that's the most insane thing you could ever hear. Because it's like, no one knows that. I've never heard that ever, that kids are immune to, to ghosts. Especially teenagers. Maybe a four year old. Maybe a four year old. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. Lucas looks like he's ready to be in a slasher film at any moment. Let's bring him with us. Especially with that jean jacket. What's so funny about it is that it's so clear that you're like, well, that line is so, is such a, uh, uh, sticks out so poorly. You know it's going to be a plot um, point later on in the episode, which is obviously what it is. But it's like, it's just, it's handled with such, um, such a sledgehammer that you're like, okay, well, again, it, it just, for me, it just kept, they kept doing things like this would maybe think as a viewer, like, why am I watching this episode? You're already telegraphing everything for me. I mean, that's the Sequest way. <laughs> I suppose. I suppose. I'll say the next episode's better than this one. Well, what I like is they assemble their team. And I mean, to me, I'm going to blame all the people who went with them because it seems unnecessarily large, this away team they put <laughs> together. But it was uh, Bridger. It's Lucas. It's the paranormal Dr. Levin. It's Dr. Westphalen. It's Chief Crocker. It's Lieutenant Commander Hitchcock. And then there's like just two random guys with them as well. And I'm just like... There's so many people. Uh, certainly, those two random guys will die. No, no. We'll never see them again. But I'm just like, this is the biggest away team onto this mission. And I swear to you, I will almost not reference any of them again for the rest of the episode. Like, there was just too many people going with this crew. There's a lot of rooms to cover. <laughs> you know what they should have done? They really should have just rounded up all the children that were on Sequest. Are there more <laughs> children on Sequest? And then they would have been, like, invulnerable. I don't think so. In the pilot... There was a sequence where they were like in trouble and there was just like a whole bunch of school children that piled out of a room. And I was just like, who are these kids? It really is like next generation. Yeah. So I think there must be families on it, but I don't know. It, it is a thing where I'm also just like, I don't think you need kids on this, su on this submarine. <laughs> anyway, they, uh, they hop on a little mini sub. They go over, they drill a hole in the wall. <laughs> of the of the ship it's so funny like a ship pulls up and there's just like a massive like a comically large drill drills a hole into the sunken ship and they like make a seal to go through into the ship and uh, they do a thing it's another thing they're telegraphing is that uh dr westphalen hands out little badges so they can tell if the air is bad inside so they don't get uh nitrogen narcosis or uh quote the rapture of the deep you don't want to get the rapture of the deep you guys <laughs> i love that band <laughs> And they end up going in and uh, sort of checking out what's happening in the ship. And very quickly, they discover that the ship's generators, after it sunk, were retrofitted to generate power using sea currents. And that the ship has been filled with large sponge osmotic membranes to generate O2. <laughs> Lots of science here. Pretty fancy. It was a lot of work to go just so you go like they can breathe here. That's the whole point of this, right? Yeah, what they're trying to show is that the, though the show, a sip sh blah. <laughs> what they're trying to show here is that though the sip sh ship sunk ages ago, <laughs> for some reason someone was able to retrofit it so they could live on it for a few more years. It's like a weird, like, we can breathe and people lived here for a while. <laughs> That's because it sank so slow. They could really plan things out.
<laughs> you know what? You're right. I I take back my complaint because totally. <laughs> that it was so slow. They came up with a new technology to to pump oxygen yeah. to the ship. Well done, well done, ghosts. They also find the dead captain. He blew his brains out in the engineering room. Apparently, he's sitting there with a gun in his hand. <laughs> and as soon as the doctor, Doctor Eleven, the the paranormal expert, sees it, he's like. Now, there's your problem right there. Uh, that'll give you some unresolved issues as a ghost, shooting yourself in the head. I'm like, oh, cool, great. Very helpful, everybody. I do like that, though. That's a, that's a funny way of saying it, Luke. You see you see a skeleton with a gun. You're like, that's your problem right there. I'm like, yeah, you think so? I think that was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and then we just get some exploring of the ship. They, like, start poking around. They find the floating skeleton room. Like, they just walk by a, by a window, and there's just, like, three floating skeletons in the side. I'm like, okie dokie. Well, that's not good. <laughs> and then they end up in a, like, spooky hallway. A door opens up on its own, and, like, Dr. Westphalen goes in, and obviously, you know, it closes behind her. We're all spooked out, and she's, she's possessed by the ghost of the, uh, the nanny they saw from the videos immediately. And... There's just a weird sequence where there's like a flaming doorknob that then becomes an ice doorknob every time they try to get inside. Yeah, do they explain why the ghosts also have these powers? It's just, it's just because they need they need to add a couple beats on, right? They need to separate the crew, I guess, so that so I guess so Dr. Westphalen like Beverly Crusher can like interact with a ghost and be possessed by it. But she's she's possessed by a ghost and then immediately finds an old wedding dress which she puts on. <laughs> so she's just wandering around in an old wedding dress the whole episode. She found the hair and makeup ghost. <laughs> Cuz she looked fantastic. Era specific hair. Yeah. <laughs> she's ready for a wedding in 1913. <laughs> And they discover the diary of the nanny when she gets out of there. And they, basically, the nanny describes how they how they lived down here for a year and a half after the ship sunk. And that uh, she's very suspicious of the captain that he uh, seems to have killed her fiancé, the engineer, who... I was like, didn't you just meet the second you got... You got this was a very quick uh, dating situation. But apparently she was also engaged to that engineer... He died early on, and she suspects the captain of killing him. And, like, she's just now been stuck down here with the murder of her fiancé is basically the idea. It makes for awkward dinners on the ship. <laughs> Absolutely. Really quick, the ghosts on the episode, they're very standard ghosts. They're, like, uh, you know, half translucent. You're very, like, classic TV ghosts where they're, they've shot the scene twice, and then they put an actor in, and then there's no actor. So you kind of get that, like, see-through ability of the actor. But the one thing I like, the little special touch they put on their ghosts, is the ghosts are like those plasma balls you touch as a kid. They're just full of lightning bolts that are constantly, like, shooting around the inside of them. And I was just like, what an interesting touch to have this, like, plasma effect inside of these ghosts. Is that because of the uh, how they spoke about the electrical mechanism to keep things going? That's what I thought it was. Oh, maybe. I mean, I was just like... Okay, cool. But they do talk a little bit about that, don't they? And the, even the opening credits have that electricity shooting through the uh, through the credits. So maybe that's what they're going for. Yeah, they're electrical ghosts. I really thought that through. Jordan had a lot of free time watching this episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't pay attention to the plot. They do one kind of really classic ghost bit where Bridger goes for a walk through the hallways and they're like filled with mist and green light and like a ghost is appearing to him out of it. And... It was the first time they tried to do something like really like classically spooky, but it's very funny because the ghost just keeps demanding he get off the ship, and Bridger just looks at the ghost. He's like, "No," and that's the end of the scene. I'm like, "Okie dokie." <laughs> that was great. That's very good. It's very. That's probably good. the best scene in the whole episode. The most ghost. The most ghosty one. It was the most ghosty one. That's what I was thinking too. I'm just like, well, this is the most promised to this premise, and this is all we're gonna get, I guess. At any rate, um, the possessed Dr. Westphalen leads them around the ship to the captain's berth. I guess she's trying to show them her, her tormentor. And when they get there, the, uh, the door is bleeding. So you know it's a bad door it's, if it's bleeding. And then I like that like they see this bleeding door and Chief Crocker just reaches out and like starts touching the blood. And I was just like, I, I don't know, man. Just maybe if you see some blood just anywhere, I don't think the first thing you do is go and touch it. I don't know. What do you think? But like, I, have a, I have a question. But why was the door bleeding? Why would the door bleed? It's not like, is it, is it, let's say the guy died being killed on the door, but then, okay, sure. So the door is possessed and shows blood on it to remind people. Like, why is the door bleeding? I could figure that out here. 
he really doesn't want you to go in there. So he's just like, don't touch this blood. Uh, this will so you'll just you be out. like, ew. Ew, that's gross. I'm not going in there. He's like, ah, well done. My ghost powers have worked again. But he's wrong because the Chief Bridger's happy to just shove his whole palm into that blood. He doesn't care. It doesn't bother him at all. He doesn't care. <laughs> For whatever reason, it's at this moment they're like, oh, now that we found his bridge or his his br- his uh, his cabin, we need to get his logbook. And I was just like, to what end? To what end do you need this logbook? But it becomes this big thing where they're like, we need to get in there. We need to get his logbook. The the flaming door trick comes back where they really like this effect. The the doorknob will just mm-hmm. burst into flames. Anyone tries to touch it, and this had to be the funniest moment of the entire episode for me because they go to grab the door. It bursts into flames. They've seen this once before, but they're like, ah, oh, it's in flames, and they go and try to grab it a second time, and it bursts into flames again. They're like, oh no, it's still doing it, and they stand there for like a quarter second and they just reach out and grab it like they do it three times in a row they just keep trying to grab this flaming doorknob i'm just like how many times are you gonna like grab this flaming doorknob they kept hoping it was gonna go cold again (laughs) and then they just turn after the third try they just turn to lucas and they're just like you try it now (laughs) i'm just just like i wouldn't if i were you lucas but uh since we know children are immune to the effects of the supernatural (laughs) Exactly. Lucas is able to open it up. Just talk about the, the jackets for a moment. Absolutely. And then Lucas has his own custom jean jacket. <laughs> jackets. And the rest of them have like sailor jackets. But man, what a deal. For sure, that was going to be released to the public as a oh, uh, piece of merchandise. I should have uh, eBayed it to see if there's any left. <laughs> I think it's going to be one of those things where, like, he's, like, you know, he's the young, cool kid, so he wears something different. And then as the show goes on, you know, they hit season four, and he's now a full-fledged member of the crew. He's wearing his uh, he's wearing his uh, uh, white turtleneck and uh, black, uh, whatever whatever they are, totally. navy, or whatever they are, his navy blacks. <laughs> he, gets, he gets his cut, hair cut a little bit, a little bit differently, you know. Maybe he wears glasses. <laughs> This is what you're imagining for the future of the show. Yeah, but obviously it doesn't it doesn't go that long. But uh, you know, one could hope. Good call on the jean jacket though. I I kept forgetting how like cool this kid was, but they really want to drive it home. Like nice jean jacket, good floppy hair. They yeah. really want this kid to be the heartthrob. I tell you, if you're a heartthrob, you need floppy hair. And I never quite had the floppy hair floppy enough because when you're a young young kid, the floppy hair, that's it. The girls go crazy over the floppy hair. And it's just like, you know, if you've got like, you know, horribly thin, <laughs> already balding hair when you're like tw- like 12 years old, it's not going to work. <laughs> A little mental picture for Jordan for the listener. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that bad. I'm just saying. You know what I mean? No, uh, Zachary Taylor Thomas, I am not. Back to the plot. Uh, Lucas does try the doorknob. He gets into the room. And then, like, the door just shuts behind him, and he's locked in the room, and, like, the rest of the crew just wanders off. Yeah, why did they do that? Because I, I think because Dr. Westphalen, the ghost uh, possessed her, just sort of walks away, and they're like, well, let's follow her. And I think Bridger hangs out for a bit, but, like, eventually they all just kind of like, well, let's just leave him in there. He'll be fine. Ghosts can't hurt children, I guess. Yeah, he'll update us later. Exactly. But what he does find is uh, the captain's logbook, finally. The whole the whole room's on fire. The ghost is mad that he's found his logbook for some reason. And then as he's opening the logbook, the ghost captain appears looking very sheepish. He's just like the ghost is suddenly just very sheepish. And he goes on to explain that he feels bad about killing the engineer and those three stowaways who accidentally drowned in the floating skeleton room. And he just explains, he's like, I trapped myself here with the nanny because I love her. And what initially his plan was apparently was the rich owner was going to make him officiate the wedding between the engineer and the nanny. He didn't want to do it because he was in love with the nanny for some reason. They've all met like maybe 36 hours ago. And to get past it, he's like, my plan is I'm going to go down to the ship's hold. I'm going to break the ship so it sinks slowly and that way, the nanny will think the engineer's bad at his job. That was his whole plan. His whole plan is to sink the ship and break it. He's still going to go down with it. His plan was always to go down with the ship and die, I guess. But he wanted them to get off. And th- the nanny would be like, well, my fiance's kind of bad at his job. So I don't like him that much anymore. But it just went awry when the engineer insisted on staying on the ship to attempt to fix it or something. They never explained. He's just like, the engineer also chooses to go down with the ship. 
And as a result, the nanny also... So it's like the most confusing reasoning they're all here or why it's sinking. It's insane. Well, I just think the captain didn't think it out. <laughs> He was he was in he was in a fit of fury, you know, and he was just like ah, everyone will pay. And then he was like, wait a minute, this is a pretty weak uh, weak motivation for me to sink this whole <laughs> ship. Oh well, sequest. But as a result, the ship sunk, and the captain and the nanny became trapped as ghosts due to their guilt over. I, for him, it's obvious what his guilt is. For her, I, I never really understood what she exactly was guilty about, but they both became trapped there because of that. But, like, the engineer and all the stowaways who died, they, like, they went to heaven ages ago. So, it's just been the two of them on this ghost ship for, like, 100 <laughs> years. Yeah. And after the ghost captain just, like, sheepishly tells Lucas all of this stuff, like, all of this exposition, Lucas is just like, I don't know, man. You ever try apologizing to the Ganani ghost? And he's just like, you know what? I should give that a shot. Maybe that would help. They've just been sequestered at different parts of the ship at this point as the ghosts. I can't imagine why you didn't have a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a hundred years, never thought about saying sorry, but why don't we all head down to the ballroom right now where her dead body's laying, and uh, I'll, I'll go apologize to it. And basically that's what happened. They all end up in the ballroom. He apologizes to the corpse. The ghost leaves Dr. Westphalen and climbs out of her corpse, and she's just like, this is all I wanted all these years. I just wanted you to say sorry for killing me at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> a heavenly yeah. light shines down. The engineer's ghost appears and says, hey, you two, I think you're ready to come to heaven. And they all just climb in and go to heaven. And I was like, what is happening here? I think it's going to continue to be awkward because it's, it's the three of them again. And they haven't really resolved things. It was just like, like, come on in. You know where this is going. And I was like, ooh, I think I do know where this is going. <laughs> and as the whole, like, crew this massive crew from sequence is standing around the ballroom watching them go to heaven for whatever reason all the air goes toxic immediately and they just are like we gotta get off this ship and it just like hard cut uh back to the ship they're like quick quick everybody we're off the ship the air went bad or something was it real or were they all hallucinating oh well uh, the episode ends with a real cliffhanger because it, it cuts back captain bridger's back in his uh room looking at the holograph of his dead wife and I thought for sure the conclusion of this episode was going to be about him learning a lesson about not, like, projecting a living hologram, a hologram of his dead wife and, like, needing to let go of the past and let go of the dead so their spirits don't, like, have to stay around on Earth. Not at all. He's just, like, telling his wife this story. He's just like, I learned nothing, though, so you're staying here as this undead version of my wife. Like, there's no lesson he's learned. And then the camera cuts to the ghost captain's logbook, which he's brought back to his room. And the little, like, badge that turns red if the air is bad suddenly turns red. And then the ghost captain starts laughing menacingly. And I was just like, what am I learning here? What is that? Like, I don't, is there, like, the revenge of the ghost captain's going to happen? I don't know what the end of this episode was. Yeah, so weird. I think it literally was, it was just spooky Halloween episode, laugh at the end. That I think that's literally as far as they thought. They're just like, it'd be fun if we had, like, a ghost laughing at the end. To what effect? doesn't matter it's cool to see a ghost laughing that's honestly the logic i think the show is operating under i mean you're almost certainly right but it was just such a weird it's such a weird episode it's such a weird little halloween episode also what was a surprise to me uh because this is the first time we've seen this derek the credits roll and sequest technical consultant bob ballard appears to give you some ocean factoids this week's factoid there are other ships that have sunk under the sea and maybe in the future they could be an undersea museum or something? <laughs> I remember that guy. <laughs> this is what you remember. Bob. It was very funny. I was just like, how odd to have a little factoid. And then I was reading the INDB trivia after I watched the episode. And the real factoid they should have given was Bob Ballard. He's one of the guys who discovered the shipwreck of the Titanic and like uh, went down there. And like a lot of that footage they used of the sunken ship was like based on his footage that he got of the sunken titanic i'm just like tell me about that bob ballard don't tell me this other stuff you're an interesting guy and this is what you're telling me well if he has to come back every episode he can't start with the big ones luke he starts with this stuff season one he's saving that up he's gonna surprise us later like you'll never guess what i found at the bottom of the ocean he's like i thought you knew stuff about me didn't you anyways guess what titanic (laughs) it is something the more i've watched of the show the more i'm just like how is James Cameron not involved in this show? (laughs) (laughs) 
You know what though? I think the um I think the the point of this um what is he an oceanographer? I don't know what this this gentleman is, but I think it's to give an air of like respectability and like authenticity that this is like a, a slightly more serious show that it's it's this is like almost like a documentary or something, which is just it's such an odd juxtaposition with the show we just watched. You know? Yeah, I mean, my understanding is he is the technical salt on the show, and given how he behaves in the like interstitials that are the over credit kind of factoid part. He's very excited to be involved, too. He, like, loves this ocean. He's really happy. He's, I think he really thinks this is going to change people's view of the ocean, this show. Yeah. I mean, maybe it will. Maybe it will have us all be more aware of uh, ghosts in the water. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you guys. You want to move on to the uh, next episode? Yeah, Bad Water. Here's the end of the summary for Season 1, Episode 8, Bad Water. We're looking for the submarine. Lights in Bad Water Hall. Do you remember where that was? Near sand. Sand move. Sand move. Landslide. Near landslide. Mr. Ortiz. Gulfstream scrub the bottom flat. It's a parking lot, sir, but there is a canyon two kilometers dead ahead. A French submarine with school children has been sucked into a fresh water hole. Sequest rushes to save them before their air runs out. Yeah, and, and let me just mention this right off the bat and, and see what you two gentlemen think. This episode has three plots. There's an A, B, and a C plot. They all kind of work to varying degrees, or they don't work to varying degrees, depending on how you feel. So there's, we're going to get this uh, uh, French school children stuck in a raft, uh, not in a raft, excuse me, in a, in a boat at the bottom of the ocean running out of air. That's one of the plots. We're going to have part of the Sequest crew stuck on a raft um, in the middle of the ocean, kind of stranded with like a hurricane coming. That's another plot. And then the other one is that um, Sequest is kind of broken and needs to kind of figure out how to operate to be able to kind of function enough that it can like solve solve problems but i don't know if like any of these three complement the other one like it's like i kept trying to think i'm like what is the better plot and i'm like i don't know if any of them are and it's weird because none of them are strong enough to stand up on their own but they're not really complete when they're all together but at the same time, it's like maybe if there was only two of them, I don't. It was such an odd episode where it, it felt like um, even the editor didn't know. It's like I, I don't know. We'll cut back to the raft. That's still happening too. But there was no um, no momentum at all. Was am I wrong in that, or is that too too a ramble to thought? You're not wrong. <laughs> it, was, it was it was pretty weird. I'm just gonna put that there. Oh, uh, Derek is showing us a signed. Polaroid of uh, Brandon. What's his last name? Brandon. No, Jonathan Brandis. I was trying to find uh, merch. The jean jacket. Yeah, jean jacket. Merch. I found a hat for $80. $80? Vintage 90s Sequest snapback. <laughs> I might pay $80 if Roy Scheider wore that hat. You can just tell people he did. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you know, like, I'm just sitting here. Like, hey, you, you see his hat, everyone? Uh, Roy Scheider wore that. Like, who's that? I'm like, um, remember Jaws? He was one of the guys. <laughs> He's Chief Brody. <laughs> I mean, Jordan, it's an interesting point you make, I think, around the three. I don't know if they're plots so much as they're just, like, they're attempts to raise the state. Like, it's supposed to get more tense, so they're just like, what can be more tense now? Because, like, none of them are plots exactly. They're just like, and now this. <laughs> But that's an interesting point you made because I think you're right. I think they're being meant to increase the tension, but weirdly, there's so many. These three plots seem to almost decrease the tension. It feels like it's almost like they don't feel like any of them are strong enough to stick with. Because like if the if the plot of this episode was Sequest has some minor sort of crisis to deal with, but the ship breaks down and they need to come together and find. Uh, different ways of looking at things and maybe someone has a skill they didn't learn and that's the way or or they need to learn and that's the way the ship gets going that's an episode or there's kids at the bottom of the ocean and they only have so much time so there's like a a stop clock you know uh, to figure out things that's an episode or part of the crew is stranded that's an episode but it's like doing all three just felt like too much in a weird way yeah, I I see what you mean. I, we'll get into it now, I think. But I, I think the real issue is just, like, a real lack of tension or momentum. Yeah, yeah. They kind of reeled it in at the end. The last few minutes, it kind of, they kind of hit their stride with it being, being a little bit more tense. Yeah, I agree. 
it just it takes a little while to get there because like as you said as we said it opens there's kids at the bottom of the ocean all these french kids they're all crying we constantly cut back to them crying as their oxygen runs out their sub captain is dead for some reason there's just a corpse in the front of the sub yeah that's what i love he's so yeah we're gonna cut back every time it doesn't really ever add anything it's just like it's still bad down there still bad down there and they have the captain just dead in the chair i was like guys you at least like Lay him down or something. He's just dead in the chair. We don't know how he died. He's just dead. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, but exactly. Put a little jacket over his head. The kids don't need to see that. Like, if you're worried about them freaking out, maybe not having old uh, uh, drooly dead face in the front there is not, you know, not, not helping too much. The, the Sequest is the last vessel able to continue the Class 5 rescue mission to find them as Hurricane Sheila sets in. And um, to make things worse, if you didn't think this was bad enough, Jordan, Hurricane. French kids at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> They're in the Bermuda Triangle. I was like, "That's right." I I forgot about the Bermuda Triangle. I was like, "What a reveal!" That I don't know. I guess I don't know if it goes anywhere. <laughs> no. It's just like, can you believe it? There's something you guys have heard about. I think what it is, is they're, they're talking about a lot that I they kind of have an explanation midway through the episode, but they see how it's like, it's extra hard because they're in the Bermuda Triangle and their sensors aren't working quite right. And like, it's that's what's maybe causing problems with the rescue mission. And maybe that's, we'll get to it, but maybe that's why there's sinkholes there. I don't know. It was just such a weird reveal that I'm just like, I thought it was going to be another spooky episode for a second, but it's not a spooky episode at all. <laughs> Thank goodness. I'll say, uh, with my complaints about the sort of momentum of the show and the sort of oddness of these plots, this is so much better than the last episode. That episode was a terrible episode of television, and it clearly almost like like a purposely kitschy sort of throwaway uh, novelty episode, where this, they're at least trying. It, it doesn't really hit what they're going for, but at least it's an episode of television. At any rate, the Sequest has also sent out one of their mini subs to help with the search. Uh, on that sub is Commander Ford, Lieutenant Krieg, Dr. Westphalen, and Kid Genius Lucas. Another real motley crew. Like, I don't know why you put these four on a ship together. One of them is the morale officer. I don't think he needs to go on a rescue mission, but okie dokie. <laughs> and why not? Their sub gets caught in a freshwater sinkhole, which. I would argue this whole episode appears to be an educational special <laughs> about s- freshwater sinkholes. I mean, they bring in that's where this that's where Dr. Levine returns. Like the ghost expert from last episode is a go- is a now a freshwater sinkhole expert this episode. They need him to come in to explain it. Can either of you explain? Maybe Derek, let's start with you. <laughs> Can you explain what freshwater sinkholes are based on the education you've just received? Well, I, I feel like I learned a lot. So there's the ocean. And there's some fresh water under the ground. And then for some reason, the ground collapses. And then the fresh water goes up and sucks everyone down. But it's in the Bermuda Triangle. (laughs) Whatever happened to the Bermuda Triangle? I don't know. We don't talk about it anymore, do we? As a kid, I remember, like, you know, on the cover of, like, Popular Mechanics and Bermuda Triangle and all these things. And now just, like, no one cares or they figured out it's just bad weather or... There was a real time where that was what we were all afraid of, was going to the Bermuda Triangle. Absolutely. You're getting <laughs> sucked out of space and time or something. I do remember. There were just no- nonstop TV shows, nonstop magazines, like unsolved mysteries. Yeah. Yeah, totally on unsolved mysteries, I'm sure. Yeah. I think we've just lost our sense of wonder in the world. Totally. <laughs> and we had real problems. <laughs> Yeah, now we have real problems. Maybe your parents never noticed. Maybe they were under, you know, they were in debt. They're trying to pay off houses. They never thought about the Bermuda Triangle at all. We're all sitting around in our rooms being like, Mom, Dad, I'm really worried about the Bermuda Triangle. (laughs) At any rate, that's a great explanation for sinkholes, by the way. Uh, That's pretty much what they tell us in this. And um, again, this is all just like science stuff. But I, I guess what it is, the additional problem is... I don't know how this works exactly. I guess because salt water, but like a buoyant object like a submarine in salt water of the ocean, I guess it, it can float. But if it goes into fresh water, there's not enough buoyancy. That's why the sub has sunk to the bottom of the sinkhole because of the fresh water that's kind of coming out. That's, I think, the whole premise of it anyway. I was really hoping that there's later on, there's a scene where uh, Nathan is talking to the dolphin and he's trying to tell the dolphin about fresh water and explain it. I was hoping that scene went on for about 20 minutes <laughs> just because there's nothing quite like listening to that dolphin speak and have someone trying to explain it to this little animatronic dolphin. He's like, fresh water. And the dolphin's like, water, clean, water. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is horrible. But anyways, it, uh, it was only on for a couple of minutes where, you know, it could have been much, much worse. 
You didn't. You didn't catch what the uh, dolphin thinks of uh, fresh water. What its it, its its name for it is? What was it? Bad water. Bad water. Wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Name of the episode. <laughs> name of the episode. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Bad water. Bad water. Bad water. <laughs> Luke, spot on. It's so good. <laughs> anyway, we'll get back to this mini sub that left Sequest with this Motley crew on it. They encounter one of these sinkholes. I guess their sub sinks into its own freshwater hole, but the crew is able to escape and get to the surface on, a, I guess they have like escape pods, and they're just in a raft now. They're all just rafting around for the rest of the episode in the eye of the hurricane that's threatening everyone. So it's very calm when they get up there, but we know trouble's coming. And sort of... You know, there's this tension of the episode now you've discussed, Jordan. They're up on the top. The hurricane's threatening them. The kids mm-hmm. are at the bottom of the ocean. They're threatening suffocation. And Sequest can't break off the rescue from saving the French kids to save the Sequest crew because that's just not their job, apparently. They can't, they can't rescue both people. So there's this... Uh, the tension that's supposed to be on the ship is that everyone on the ship feels bad that their crewmates are in trouble, but they're not allowed to do anything about it. I don't know if it quite lands, but that's they keep they keep harping on this idea that they're like we could go save our crew, but we gotta focus on these French kids. And like that seems to be the main like push and pull for Captain Bridger anyway. Yeah, exactly. Of course, your results may vary on how tense you found that. I mean, it wasn't very tense, but no, I I think it really is unfortunately for the show. And it's again, it's not even so much as a bad episode, but in terms of creating that tension, they fall flat. I just think anytime they try to ratchet it up, it's just like another scene. Yeah, but the Rafties will spend... That's why I call them, by the way, the Rafties, those people in the rush. <laughs> that's pretty good. They'll spend the rest of the episode trying to come up with ways to signal for rescue. And, like, literally every time we cut back to them, they're just like, what if we tie this metal fishing line to our radio and increase our radio strength? And then, like, immediately drop the radio to the bottom of the ocean? Tension, Luke. Tension. They were so close. And then, like... They're pulling out rations and the rations on reflective paper. And they're just like, what if we tape all the reflective paper together and turn it into a giant flag that radar will hit? And as soon as they finish that, it blows away in the wind. Again, it's so weird because there's some there's a semblance of a good episode here. You would learn a little something about the characters. They're away from the main crew. They have to solve problems based on what they have and it's like and every time they kind of do it you're like okay that's something interesting and then like you're saying they're just like all right it's gone and it's like i i guess in the service of showing how bad the situation is but it just makes the scenes kind of pointless to keep going like hey i got a key for this lock anyways the lock is gone you're like uh, okay thanks thanks for that <laughs> It was very strange. I was just like, every time we cut back, they have a new solution that they immediately mess up somehow. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. But in their efforts to get the signal through, Sequest does pick up a couple, like, I guess, radar pings or, like, radio messages or something from the rafties on the top of the surface. So this is where you're talking about is, is Bridger's just like, I'm going to send the dolphin up there. I'm going to explain to him first about fresh water <laughs> so he knows not to get stuck in a sinkhole. <laughs> but I'm going to send the dolphin up there. And I'm also going to shoot out a communications boy which appears to just be this big boy that Sequest can shoot out of its butt because we get a big sequence of its butt opening up and this like boy shooting out of it with a big long cable attached that floats to the surface. The nine million dollar butt buoy. A nine million dollar butt buoy. That's what. That's the like, <laughs> literal quote from the show. <laughs> and very quickly, the Rafties. Uh, they they just come across this boy in the open water. They're like, hey, look, it's it's Sequest boy. And then the dolphin pops up and they're like, Darwin, you're here. You have to tell them where we are. But it's at this point, the hurricane's coming in. There's lightning everywhere. Things are going to go bad. And um, as, as Darwin described, there's some loud light, loud <laughs> light. <laughs> oh, please. Let's do a whole podcast just doing uh, Darwin's voice. <laughs> People pe- will never get such hate mail. <laughs> the uh, the loud light sends down a bolt of electricity that hits the communications boy that's in the water, and uh, it shoots all the way down the cable, blows out all the systems on Sequest. Like every single system is done. They're dead in the water, and I was just like, "Well, now you're all gonna drown." <laughs> yeah. Or are they, Luke? Are they? Or are they? That's the big question. It kind of brings up, this is your point, the sequest is sort of like third problem they face. Is once they're knocked out, the uh, the whiskers, and I don't know if you know this, Derek, there's 
uh, Sequest has these three little drones that fly around providing sensor reasons. I'm sure you saw them. They're called the Whiskers. And they're like, we'll bring one in and we'll power the ship using one of them. We'll attach to all the systems. It only has enough power to run each system one at a time. So they come up with a solution that they'll do a rotation. Every system will run for 30 seconds at a time in a loop. It didn't, it wasn't the worst solution. The sort of idea like, we're going to power certain things because we can do it. But why they just picked an arbitrary thing of 30 seconds? Because what if someone needed 45 seconds to get a job done? They're like, well, you got to wait for the loop to come back around. It's like, well, just use it for this person needs to do something to get one task done. Okay, that task is done. Now move on. 30 seconds was incredibly arbitrary and wasn't helpful. It raised some questions later in the episode, too, because mid, as they continue, they obviously start rescuing everybody. But the ship seems fully functional by the time they get to the rescue section. Like, this whole, like, 30 seconds of power thing seems to have slipped away from their minds. Totally. I think it was a little bit like 30 seconds foot on the gas. Okay, take it off. <laughs> 30 seconds foot on the gas. And the ship just kept kind of going by inertia. At any rate, Darwin gets back to Sequest after the uh, lightning strike. And it, the dolphins all, that poor robot dolphins all blistered up. It looked really gross. Yeah, poor guy. And he has seen the French sub in a hole. Darwin, as on his way back... He, he ended up going past some bad water, and he's like, hey, I saw that sub. I saw that French sub. I, I need to tell you, uh, Captain Bridger. And then Captain Bridger asks him more questions. He's like, I don't know. It was near a landslide or something. Like, the dolphin's not helpful at all. Like, he can't give any directional. I, I was just like, what's the purpose of any of this dolphin stuff? It was funny that that's – it is true. They sent the dolphin out, and it was just time-wasting. He comes back. He's like, lightning or whatever he said. And you're like, thanks. Thanks, dolphin. And then you think, you, you stop, you go, oh, wait, yeah, they did send a dolphin, <laughs> to be fair. I mean, I don't know what he thought. It was like, he, he comes back, and I'm like, have you just been eating tuna the whole time? He's like, I like tuna, you know? It's like, what is it going to do? It's true. His whole mission was to go up to the surface to find the missing crew members. I don't think he ever makes a report on that. <laughs> Too busy. Dolphins, what are you going to do? Unreliable. <laughs> That's why I got fired from the army. <laughs> Is Darwin in the first episode? He is in the first episode. Oh, He's fun. introduced right away. Right, this right, uh, right. And heavily featured, far more actually yeah. than these two episodes. It was a real wasted opportunity not to have that dolphin on the ghost ship, I think. I think we could have really <laughs> used Darwin on the ghost ship. Well, maybe it's only young ch- kids that aren't affected by ghosts, not, not dolphins. Oh, what if that? That would have been the move. Dolphins aren't affected by the supernatural. <laughs> we need to bring Darwin onto the ghost ship. <laughs> bring him in a little aquarium? <laughs> Exactly. Just wheeling him around. <laughs> Put a little jean jacket on him. He's ready to go. Well, he would definitely have a jean jacket. <laughs> I mean, Derek, you're you're from uh, my home province. So you know as well as anyone that ultimately dolphins aren't that helpful. That's why uh, <laughs> we at West Edmonton Mall had to kill them all. True. That's true. They wouldn't wear their fanny packs like Luke. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, Alberta, the Prairie Province used to have quite the population of dolphins until we took care of them. Slowly, slowly, Very slowly, like that slow sinking ship. Ay, ay, ay. It's at this point in the episode now that it's everything's at its worst. Essentially, is what we're supposed to get from this. It's a real like classic uh, storytelling method. Ships broken, people are gonna die in the storm above. French kids are gonna drown in the uh, ocean below. We're at their lowest moment, and they kind of come up with solution. Now that they have 30 seconds of power, they're going to start searching these sinkholes to try to find them. They're somewhere in one of these sinkholes at the bottom of the Brito Triangle is this French sub. And they're, they're, they're just sending, they're taking little peeks over each hole. They find a sunken locomotive from like the turn of the century, which are like, well, that's why our sensors won't work. It's made of iron. It's like, okie dokie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why not? At this point, why not? I do like one of the crews like, how did that get down? And then they're like, in the olden days, we just threw stuff off ships sometimes. I'm like, okay, great. Great explanation, everybody. For me to try and go, guys. Come on. Come on. It just got, <laughs> got stuck there. Again, I'll make the point. More of this episode than the last. This is Baywatch Edge of the Water, everyone. You just have to go, okay. But Bridger has an idea. He's like, if we follow the sinkholes on the axis of the continental shelf towards Florida... Those will be the ones most likely to have fresh water in it. So let me use an old sea trick by looking at a bubble on a level, like on you'd have on your uh, on a ruler or something, and I'll be able to navigate us using the bubble so that we're going in the right direction. It's like, okay, sure, great, perfect. Let's <laughs> let's go. Why you didn't do any of this before when you're looking for the sub, I don't know, but 
they continue down and they find the canyon that uh, Darwin saw with the rock slide and they find the sub in it. And they're like, all right, great. Let's drop the, quote, grappling magnet and we'll grab them. And uh, they're like, we did it. We found the sub. But we have another problem is it's at the bottom of a really big sinkhole. And if we pull it up and Sequest puts its full weight on the roof of this sinkhole, the roof, the roof will collapse and Sequest will also be sucked down by the influx of fresh water. Mm-hmm. And now maybe this is my biggest problem with Sequest is that I'm not a sea scientist. <laughs> That's what they're counting on. But the entire time I'm watching it, and they're telling this problem. There's like the weight of Sequest will break the roof. I'm like, float. You're in water. Just float above this. You don't have to. You don't have to rest on it, Sequest. You're your submarine. Float. Just float a little bit. And I was just like mad the whole time. It's like you don't. I don't understand why this is a problem. <laughs> but it's a problem. I thought it was Luke. I thought it was, and, and maybe I'm wrong. I thought it was because they needed some leverage to send down like a cable to pick the other ship up, and they couldn't do that on their own. Maybe I'm wrong. But the, it's a it's a cable. It goes down. It just sinks. <laughs> no, in terms of like having the um uh, when pulling it back up, they didn't have the weight. They needed to like be positioned to get to like essentially push off of something. But maybe that's dumb. Is that dumb? It's it's also like a, the most a giant submarine ever. And it's a little tiny rescue pod. I don't know how that would outweigh it. Uh, well, you know what? Uh, I will counter with bad water. <laughs> That's not me. Bad water. <laughs> <laughs> it answers everything. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, this is, I think, where it's just like, if this were in space, I 100% wouldn't have questioned it. I just would have been like, of course, that explanation makes perfect sense. But for some reason, because it's just underwater, I'm just like, I know a little something about water. <laughs> and you just float in it. So I don't see the problem. <laughs> We've all been in water. We've never been in space. So Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> A real armchair navigator or armchair bridger on this show for some reason. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, this is the problem. If they put too much weight, they might collapse and sink. And Bridger's just like, well, I've got a great idea then. If we just collapse the roof like we just said we shouldn't, the displaced water from the collapsing roof will cause an influx of salt water. And we'll just ride that wave of salt water up before we sink. So essentially his solution is float. (laughs) <laughs> just like my solution but float after you like break the roof which also like they show the roof breaking and the french kid sub is almost crushed repeatedly by like rocks i'm just like i'm like there's nothing smart about this plan you just got lucky those kids weren't crushed to death i love it that they actually mention it though they're like so funny. They're, we're not gonna knock down all the the rubble and they're like you know what's down there though the french kid they're like yep and then they show just shots of it just kidding they're just like carry on <laughs> i guess that's the chance we got to take <laughs> carry on oh dear um at any rate this is it they save they save the french kids at the bottom of the ocean i guess they're pulling them up with their like magnetic grappling hook and now it's time to worry about the rafties so we cut from this to the rafties they're giving up hope they're at the top of the they're at the top of the ocean everything's gone wrong they have no they have no way of saving themselves except what did they do derek well I just thought of something. They should have sung more sea shanties. Oh, that's true. That probably would have. <laughs> that probably would have helped. I forgot about that. When when the whole ship is down, <laughs> Ca- Chief Crocker just leads in a, a a long thirty second sea shanty where the entire crew pulls together and just sings sings a song. Yeah, it was good stuff. I'll just add to that. Would that scene not have been better if they had cut to Darwin and he had sung along with them? <laughs> yes. <laughs> It would have been better. That's what this is missing. I think yeah. they should be singing a lot more. The, the whole crew should just sing a lot more on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe that will be what the what's going to keep the show going. No, the Rafties have come up with one final solution on how to get saved, how to send a message down to Sequest to where they are, since I guess the dolphin can't report those coordinates and was sent for no reason. They have hacked a camera so that they can push the shutter button on it to wind the camera and send Morse code under the water. Yeah. Yep. Sure, why not? And that apparently sends the information they need down to old Ted Raimi. He picks it up, and uh, just as they're losing hope, what we see is like an overhead shot of the raft floating in stormy waters and just all these lights rising up above it because Sequest is there to save them. Yeah. Uh, so it all worked out. Everybody got saved. Yeah, there wasn't a big deal. Why why was everyone worried? Why were you singing sea shanties? Everything was going to be fine. And that 30 seconds of power really got them a long way. 
<laughs> I'm telling you, it was inertia. <laughs> um, and of course, the credits roll, and Sequest's technical advisor, Bob Ballard, returns to tell us that, in fact, sinkholes are all over the place off the coast of Florida. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> like, thanks, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hope he comes up and he's like he starts running out of facts at a certain point. He just starts telling about his life. He's like, I had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich today. I mean, I'm telling you right now, he's already run out of facts. (laughs) He hasn't got to the Titanic. I mean, that's it for these two episodes. But I don't know. Does anyone have any final notes? Anything we didn't cover, Derek? Is there anything you wanted to talk about we didn't we didn't touch on? Well, I I missed a line. I'm mentioning a line earlier that the the comms officer said, and he's like, the children are frightened, and that. Put a lot of weight. Uh, we missed that level of pressure. That we haven't discussed that yet. But, oh, we forgot. Yeah, we yeah. didn't mention the children. They were frightened. They were frightened. I thought it was a good line. I did like the amount of French the crew had to use in this episode. Yeah. I liked also liked the fleur-de-lis they had on their jackets. Did you notice that? <laughs> just to make sure they're French. you got to know they're French. And it's just like every time we cut back, they're speaking French on the ship. And we cut up, and Ted Raimi's, like, speaking French into microphones, and I'm just like, how much French did he have to learn for this episode? Maybe he casually mentioned he could speak French, and they're like, stop right there. We got an episode we're exactly, going to write. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it would explain why they were inexplicably French children. <laughs> All right, before we get to ratings, I have a little post-episode. It's not quite a segment. Let's call it a mini-segment we're going to do. <laughs> Jordan, I don't think you can participate, because I think you know the answers to this already. Okay, fine. I'll just keep drinking my tea. <laughs> but when we watched the pilot, Jordan, you mentioned that there were going to be some major retools done with season two. Like they're going to probably do some mm-hmm. recasting. You implied it was going to get sexier. The show is going to get sexier in the recasting. I mean, it couldn't get less sexy. That is true. That is true. <laughs> I mean, we've got uh, the captain walking around with his uh, actual walker everywhere he goes. He can barely <laughs> <move>. <laughs> The ship just reeks of Ben Gay. (laughs) But I don't know who's going to leave the show. You've implied, though, that there's going to be people who leave the show, which Mm -hmm. I think makes sense. Like, uh, Derek, you know probably as much about these characters as I do now, because by and large in the pilot, they showed very little of any of these characters other than the captain and the kid genius. So I want us, Derek, you and I, because I think Jordan knows the answer to this already. Who do you think is going to survive into season two? Because I think... Quite a few of these characters could easily be cut and not matter. And next episode of the podcast will be starting season two. Uh-huh. So I, I want right now for us to like make predictions for which cast gets cut. I'm just going to go with I think it's wiped clean. Oh, you you think it's it's a clean slate? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Captain's got to stay, obviously. <sighs> you think so, but... I don't know. You don't think you don't think uh, old Darwin's gonna get himself a turtle? Well, okay, okay, Darwin, and hopefully Sea Shanty sticks around. Yeah, okay, Chief Chief Crocker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh she, that's what they should call him. Just Sea Shanty. Sea Shanty. His name. <laughs> this show would be better if everyone just had crazy nicknames. Every show would be better. <laughs> I all right. I know Lucas won't leave because he's this. He's the sexy kid. True. He's the heartthrob. He's not going anywhere. I know for a fact the captain's not going to go. I know he will go eventually, but I don't think he's going in second season. How many seasons were there? Three. There are three seasons. Oh, wow. And I also know that Ted Raimi is in it for the duration. So I know Ted Raimi's not going anywhere. I think we're going to lose Chief Crocker. I think he. I think they're going to be like, he's too old. He's not sexy. He's, he's out. We've already got one old man. We don't need two. I think he's gone. I don't know. I feel like... Dr. Westphalen's done because I think she's also, well, she's a love interest for the captain. I think they're going to be like also too old. I think they're going to cut her as well. Totally. They need a way younger doctor for him to be in love with. Honestly, I think Derek's right. I think most of the characters could go. Like, I mean, I'm like Krieg, the morale officer, who, Derek, the only thing you saw him in was like on the surface, like talking the talking Lucas in for, uh, down from like diet. Like, he's like, Lucas, we're going to make it. I, he could go. I don't yeah. know why we need him. Uh, On the uh, the little mini submarine in the emergency, he was like hitting buttons like a madman there when they were going down. That's true. I think he'll be okay. I think I think that Commander Ford will be okay. Yeah. But I, as that's what I'm gonna go with. I'm gonna go with the morale officer. I'm gonna go with Doctor Westphalen's not gonna make it. I think Chief Krieg's not gonna, or Krager or whatever his name is, is not gonna make it. I think those three are done. I think it's more than that. But yeah, I don't know. Jordan, do you know? Do you know who's gone the next ep- next season? I do. 
How close am I? You don't have to tell me exactly, but like, am I close? You're very close. Is Derek closer? Is it closer to a clean sweep? <laughs> um, n- no. It's. I would say. I would say it's probably closer to you, Luke. Okay. Okay. So so maybe three people. I'm probably missing someone. <laughs> yeah. Well, a surprise for me next episode when I watch yeah. season two. <laughs> yeah. All right, you guys. Let's let's get into ratings then. So we've got the first one. We've got Night of Shadows, the ghost episode. Derek, as you know, we sort of treat this like IMDb ratings as an out of 10 stars, if you will. You can base it whether you want it to be on your personal enjoyment or a more critical eye. It's all totally up to you. This is a real free-ranging review segment. So what do you think out of 10? What, what do you want to give Night of Shadows? Two? <laughs> <laughs> well, we agreed that there was one point for something earlier. I can't remember what it was. But yeah, it was, especially as the first episode to get back into this show, it was like a weird... A really weird one to start with. I think that's very fair. A two. What about you, Jordan? How do you how do you feel about Night of Shadows? You know what? I, I've been a bit of an apologist for the show, but this is a this is a bad episode, like top to bottom. I, I will give it a little bit of leeway because I think it's, I think they're trying to have some fun. I don't think it really works. I think they're just like, yeah, what if we did a ghost episode? Wouldn't that be fun? Without really thinking about the implications or the execution, but it's a bad episode of TV. So it's a three to ten. Three out of ten. Wow. Yeah. Maybe in like the fourth season they could have agreed pulled off a Halloween episode. Not like, see, yeah. Two months into the show, where yeah. the audience still is kind of like getting a feel for it, they're like, "Wouldn't it be funny if there was a ghost?" Like, no, no, it wouldn't. <laughs> One thing I thought you'd be more angry about, Jordan. I don't know mm. why this makes you so angry sometimes. But the title of the show is Night of Shadows, but it's not night like the dark of night. It's night like a medieval night. And I was just like, what does that mean? What, what, who is the Knight of Shadows in the context of this episode? You know, it's funny. I never even saw that. I just, I thought that was going to weigh on you. I like this episode. Sorry. I like it. Luke, it would insane. have been better Terrible. if the dolphin came. But I was just like, sure, it's a ghost episode. I, I don't care. I'm on board for a ghost episode. I'm, I had a nice time. I'm giving it a six. Wow. <laughs> All right, well, let's do Bad Water then. Let's see if your your ideas for the show change in probably a more standard episode of Sequest, Bad Water. Derek, what, what do you think of Bad Water? Um, it was pretty fun, so like six and a half. Six and a half. So a, a pretty big turnaround on uh, on the last oh, yeah. episode. Night and day. Jordan, you seem to you seem to quite enjoy this ne- the second you know what? one. So uh, yeah, it's it's not a great episode, but I I'm feel similar to Derek. Uh, I think it's after watching. The last one, you have to just like at least double this thing. It's six out of ten, just because it's it's not a ghost episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we discussed a lot of its faults. It's got a real problem with momentum and tension, and like mm-hmm. it's just like a lot of things happening, but it's hard to care about any of them. And I didn't, I didn't care about any of them. Uh, this was a real drag for me. I was very annoyed. I think maybe my problem is I don't think the sea is interesting and I don't think <laughs> it's dangerous and I don't believe any of the problems they were having down there. I'm giving it three out of ten. So you need ghosts. I need ghosts. It's funny because you do the o- you do the opposite, but I think it's because you just generally don't like the actual concept of the show. So when they get out of the concept of the show, you enjoy it more, but I enjoy it less when they get away from what I think the show is supposed to be about. Jordan, I never want to hear about freshwater sinkholes again. You know how many times they talked about freshwater sinkholes? It was like a 40-minute educational episode on freshwater sinkholes. I'm like, this isn't an episode of anything. I don't want to learn about freshwater sinkholes. That's where we differ, my friend. They really wanted us to to educate us on that, that situation. There is, I think, a real idea, and I think maybe that is part of the idea behind the show. I think there's a real... We want to teach you about the sea while you watch this idea to it. That's probably why they have the stuff with Bob at the end. Yeah. I do think that's legitimately something they're going for. Absolutely. Um, so I don't I don't know. I just don't want to be taught anything. I don't want to learn. <laughs> I just think the moral of the story is that Florida is going to disappear into a freshwater sinkhole. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. Sequest exactly. predicted it. Yeah, exactly. Well, until that sweet, sweet day comes, (laughs) we want to thank you, Derek, for being here. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I hope you had a good time. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks for having me. It was fun. I'm glad these were the two episodes that you watched. They were both so far apart and so weird. Uh, Yeah, it was a very strange combination of uh, 
shows for sure. Especially jumping back into the ghost one. Like I was very confused. <laughs> I knew you were gonna get some whiplash as soon as you started. <laughs> oh yeah. And I just I just spoiled the 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 season changes, the casting changes, and it's all coming back to me and you're gonna you're gonna like it. I'm going to say one thing right now, and this is my prediction, and it's only because I remember this after we watched the pilot, is my strongest memory of the show Sequest is there was a man with gills, and they went to a lot of trouble to introduce him, and I thought for sure that was in the pilot, so I don't know when this man with gills enters the scene, but it's got to be next season. Is that weird? I literally said, I actually didn't know that was a thing, and I mentioned that I thought that was what the show didn't want, is people with gills and stuff, but, but hey, what do I know? I just have a strong sense memory of being a child and there being like a cool ex-Navy guy who quit and got genetic surgery to have gills and they like went out of their way to find him and bring him to the crew. There's like a long like plot line in, in what I thought was the pilot, but it must be season two. He's uh, he's Kevin Costner from Westworld. <laughs> yeah, from Westworld specifically. Not Westworld. What was that show? What was that Water movie? He had World. gills between... Waterworld, excuse me. He had gills on his ears. <laughs> No, you're thinking of the sorry. postman, I think. The postman. No, no, no. I'm thinking of uh, Waterworld. <laughs> Derek, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, guys. That was fun. And listener, as we are skipping through the best of, uh, you know, probably sort of. debatable best of Sequest, <laughs> there is an opportunity for us to go back and watch some episodes that you maybe think we, we've missed that we might enjoy more. Uh, it's called Bonus Episodes for Charity. If you head to our website, continuumdrag.podbean.com, we have all the information there. You can also find it on our social media. There's links to it there. But the idea is you make a donation to a charity as selected by a past guest, and we will go back and watch an episode of a series that we missed when we were watching it. Like with Sequest, we're watching the best of, so we're missing a whole bunch of episodes. Sometimes we take the escape pod, and we got out of Quark before we got to the special two-part episode of Quark. So we never saw that. Maybe you want us to go back, and you want to pay double and make us watch a double episode of Quark. Who knows? I don't know what you want. Uh, you can do that by doing a donation to charity for this bonus episodes for charity. Uh, you can find all that information on the website, as I mentioned before, or just send us an email, continuedrag.gmail.com, and I can explain all the details before you make that donation so you, so you know what you're doing if you like. But that's just an opportunity for you to make us much more of this stuff. More the stuff you love, we want to watch more of it, but only for charity. <laughs> exactly. And on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook now, you can find clips from these episodes. We're going to have... A lightning striking the butt boy of Sequest. It's going to get hit right in the butt boy. Um, <laughs> there's going to be ghosts, so many ghosts, bleeding doors, doorknobs lighting on fire. We're going to have all of that on, on social media. Talking dolphins. It should only be the, just the scenes with the dolphin talking. That's all we should ever post for the show. That is true. I should go back and make sure I've ever pulled. I'm not even sure I've pulled any stalking <laughs> dolphins. I should go back and check and make sure. <laughs> Bad water. Bad water. <laughs> you can find that. Our handle on social media is at Continuum Drag. <laughs> oh, honestly, let's do a whole episode. It'd be the best thing ever. <laughs> it'd be exhausting, but it'd be amazing. Yeah, that would be exhausting, but amazing. Uh, that wraps it up for this episode. So, listener, thank you for joining us. And, Jordan, I'll see you next week. See you then. Continuum Drag is recorded in Toronto, Ontario, and Seoul, South Korea. Theme music by James Rick Seedler. Produced by Jordan Dalek and Luke Black. Special thanks to Aaron Younes.